Life teaching series, the Blessed Life teaching series. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. As you guys turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, as I was studying this text and thinking about it, today we're going to be looking at the specifics of the mercy of God and what the mercy of God infers in verse 7, and we're going to get into greater detail about all of those things in just a moment, but as I was thinking about this concept of mercy, I began thinking about how when we are all were a kid, and some of us even do do this to this day, where we do something that we probably shouldn't have done, and then we immediately ask for mercy. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't touch that. Please, please don't punish me. Please, please don't, please, please spare me, please. And so we extend mercy to our children. And all of you, though, all of you here who are like, I've never done that before. Apparently skipped childhood because we've all done that before. We've all done something in our childhood that we can recall right now in this moment where we've had to not just ask for mercy, but very, very possibly beg for mercy. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, I was taking a pretty important math test, and uh, I finished my test. I finished it a little early, and in my infinite wisdom as a fifth grader, I said, you know what? This is a great opportunity to play Nintendo in my desk. So I pulled out my Nintendo, and I'm flipping it open inside my desk, and I'm playing Pokemon, and then all of a sudden, my friend finishes his test, and back in the day on Nintendo devices, there was this thing called Nintendo Chat, and you'd be able to instant message each other on Nintendo from Nintendo to Nintendo. We're playing Pokemon together, and then the teacher finds out that I'm playing Pokemon in my desk during a test. A, a test that I forgot to mention was the FCAT, which is a very big state test. If you don't pass the FCAT, you don't continue on when I was in school in third and fifth grade. And for some reason, if you're accused of cheating, it's immediate failure. I don't know who came up with that rule, but she thought we were cheating. We were passing each other answers on Nintendo Chat. I'm like, I have not touched my test since I've completed it. It's been in the top corner of my desk, just like you instructed me. Please do not fail me. Please do not tell anybody. Please don't fail me. Please don't take my Nintendo away because then I'm going to explain this to my parents. Just please show me mercy. She did not show me mercy. And so the resource officer had a conversation with us and the principal. And at the end of the day, I did get a little bit of mercy. I didn't get my Nintendo back till the end of the school year. But I did I was allowed to submit my test. And thankfully, I was able to continue on. But I, I definitely begged and pleaded for mercy. I said, I know what I did, but please withhold the punishment from me because I, 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 didn't, I didn't consciously know what I was doing. And that's kind of what all of us do, even in today's circumstances or situations. Perhaps it's, I knew the bill was due on the 1st, but it's like 7 p.m. on the 1st, and I know it's not going to go leave the bank until tomorrow, but can I like pay it today without a late fee? Is that possible? And so we, we make these inferences and assumptions about mercy. And as I'm reading this text and I'm thinking about what to say, and, and God is leading me into what should be said in today, today's message, I began circling back to these instances of this childlike sense of mercy. You know what you did. You know what you deserve. But then you beg and plead to please withhold the punishment from us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 said, says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The main idea today is we cannot experience the blessed life. We cannot experience the blessed life until we embrace mercy. Until we embrace mercy. Until we embrace mercy. Now, there's a lot going on in this one verse, talking about something that we all have asked for at one point in another. In order to try to deconstruct what's happening here and gain a better insight of what Jesus is saying to the disciples, I think it's important for us to ask a few questions. 
I have my kids don't know this word yet. Um, and perhaps that's through some intention, but it's the word why. Why, why is there, why is God giving us mercy? There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a purpose. Why mercy is being talked about here. Why, 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 why? And so in this verse, we can ask ourselves, who is in fact giving mercy? Who is the, the one who is giving mercy? In Bible college, when, stu- when learning how to study scripture and learning how to translate the biblical text from the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, is considered a logical fallacy to assume that every definition of a word is true. There's some instances, instances of this in the English language as well, where you just assume that the word means something because it meant that somewhere else or in a different context. The same fallacy is true with scripture. And it's really common practice for people to do this. But in this instance here, in this verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, as we look to the definition of the word mercy, it is important to note that it is both and. It is all of these things. That is what the Lord is getting at here. The word can be defined, the word mercy, the originally translated word mercy could be to have mercy on, to help one afflicted or seeking aid, to help the afflicted, to bring help to the wretched, to experience mercy. It's both sides, the receiving of mercy and the giving of mercy. And that's what the Lord is getting at in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 5 as he's teaching the disciples. It's also important to understand when we're talking about mercy, and I've seen and heard a lot of people and speakers and pastors use mercy and grace interchangeably, inferring that it's the exact same thing, mercy and grace, mercy and grace. But in fact, mercy is God withholding what we deserve, God not giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. It goes back to the very simple explanation and what we've experienced as children. We do something wrong and we ask for mercy. Please withhold the punishment from me. Whether we knew what we were doing or not, but please do not punish me. And grace is the extension of mercy, saying, I forgive you. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you because I've shown you mercy. I have shown you mercy. Who is giving mercy in this passage that he is speaking to, this pure sense of mercy? It's easy to infer that it is the Lord God himself, Jesus, who is the one speaking, is the one who's giving this sense of mercy, this pure sense of mercy, a mercy that is extended, that is unbiased, that cannot be compromised, a mercy that has no motive or reason, logical reason. It is simply mercy to both receive and to give. When asking who is giving mercy, it's important to know when reading this verse that Jesus Christ is the one who is extending mercy for all of us, but it's also important to ask for what reason? For what reason is the God of the universe extending mercy to us? Why is he giving us mercy? Why is he showing us mercy? There's no logical reason for it. The only fact is is that Jesus has come and died for all of our sins. He's come and died for all of our sins. He's accepted the punishment so God can withhold that punishment from all of us. What we do deserve. For what reason has God given us mercy? For what reason has God given us mercy. 
when looking at this text, it's important to look at it in its full context, to get a full picture of what's going on. It says in verse 1, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began, teach, teach, began to teach them, saying, Jesus, Jesus, teaching his disciples. Jesus is teaching his disciples. The crowds are bystanders. He's speaking to the people he knows intimately, the people he has a relationship with. And he goes on to say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to live in relationship with God. This is what to expect in a life, in a relationship with the Lord. But that's not what we're going to experience. We're going to experience the inverse of what God is getting at here. What the Lord is saying, living on this side of heaven, means we're going to experience poverty and persecution and a lack of mercy and grace. It's only by being in a relationship with him that a byproduct will be that we will be blessed. It's not that we're going to just simply skate through life because we have a relationship with God. And we are inherently blessed because we know Jesus. You are no more blessed than any individual person. We are all deserving of what we have incurred. The debt of our works, the debt of our everything. I don't even have to get into extreme detail because the voice in the back of your mind from little up has told you, I am not deserving. I am not deserving. I beg and plead for mercy. I know what I did. I'm not deserving of it. That's why you get upset. Just like when you were a child, I see it in my kids' faces when they do something wrong and they know they've done wrong and they're so upset and then you extend them mercy. And then you have to reassure them and tell them, you're not deserving of this, but I'm going to extend you grace because I love you. I know who has shown me mercy. It's the Lord Father God who lives inside of me and dwells inside of me and impacts every single decision and action that I take for the reason that he loves me. So as a byproduct, I love you and I will extend you mercy and show you grace. Just because we're a Christian doesn't mean we're going to skate through life and just bypass all the hard things. No, Jesus is saying to the disciples, the, one he, the ones he knows best, the ones he's teaching here in this text, you will experience these things, but as a byproduct, you will experience the blessed life. You'll experience poverty, persecution, lack of mercy from the very people who are standing around us, a lack of grace. And in some instances with these disciples, they'll be put to death for their faith. But Jesus is telling them, you are and you will experience the blessed life. The Christian life is not easy. The blessed life is not the easy life. But for what reason? For what reason does he give us mercy? We ask for mercy. We beg for mercy. We have some level of understanding of what mercy is. But the truth is, church, a lot of us here, myself included, from time to time, some of us maybe even today, we don't ever really truly embrace mercy. We break it down. We construction, constructively understand what mercy is. We take the time to ask for it. We take the time to beg for it, but we don't actually embrace it. We get just to the line so we can feel good enough to move on, but we don't actually embrace it. Because if we embraced mercy, our lives would look dramatically different. Embracing mercy is acknowledging something that nobody in this room really wants to do. It's the fact that we're not deserving. In order to truly embrace mercy, we must understand and acknowledge the fact that we are not deserving. Church, you're never going to be deserving. 
Stop coming to the line and saying, I know who God is. I understand there's an option for me that I can accept the free gift of grace through his son, Jesus Christ. I understand that I'm not deserving and I know that I could do better. So I'm going to do better before I approach the throne room, before I ask God to come into my life, before I do the next good thing. We come right up to the line, but we never fully embrace mercy because we have to acknowledge the fact that we are undeserving. Church, just stop for a moment. Admit you're not worthy. You're not deserving, but it's okay because God has given each one of us mercy. He has shown us mercy. He has shown us and defined the word mercy. He doesn't care that you're not deserving. He only cares that you acknowledge that you're not deserving. Because it is when you acknowledge the fact that you need mercy to the point where you fully embrace it, that is the only way you can share mercy. You can express mercy. It's from an overflow of the pure sense of the, the word mercy. Otherwise, it's just shallow forgiveness and empty words. Someone says something to you and you get upset and so you show mercy by saying, I'm not holding a grudge. But then it's in the back of your mind as if there isn't forgiveness. As if there isn't, wasn't a true sense of mercy. You see, the only way to encounter the blessed life is to embrace mercy. Acknowledge we're not deserving, that there is a merciful God out there who wants a relationship with you, who wants to extend you mercy time and time and time and time again because we are not worthy and we're going to continue to mess up. But God is infinite and infinite in his mercy and love. Who's extending the mercy? God himself. For what reason? Because he loves us. Because he understands we are not deserving. The only thing that is stopping you in this moment is you acknowledging the fact that you are not deserving and you need his mercy. Instead, rather than giving God a full embrace and loving him for what he has done for you, we would rather side hug God. We'd rather just tap him on the shoulder and say, thanks for coming along. We would rather just keep going in the path in the direction that we're heading because we think we know what's best. We would much rather wade in the fact that we know we're not deserving and we're never going to get our life cleaned up or we're never going to do better. And we're just going to continue moving along with God by our side and side hugging him all the way rather than stopping and giving him a full embrace and acknowledging the fact that he is merciful and he has forgiven everything we have ever done, everything we will do because he is merciful. For what reason? Because he loves us. And to be honest with you, do I need to give another reason? Now all of this is happening. We know that God has given us mercy. We know he has shown us what mercy looks like. We know the reason behind the mercy, the fact that he loves us. But there's got to be a purpose behind this. There's got to be a purpose why he's extending mercy to us. We got to go back to that childhood faith where we just ask why, 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 why? If I'm going to experience all the things you said I'm going to experience, I got to ask why. And if I'm going to have to experience that in order to experience the blessed life, then I got to ask why. I got to ask who's giving me the mercy. I got to ask what's your reasoning behind this. And I got to ask for what purpose? You see, when you embrace mercy and you really embrace mercy and you, you latch on to mercy, you latch on the fact that you are undeserving and that God has withheld the punishment that you deserve, it changes everything. It fills you up to a point where you can overflow into other people's lives. You don't have to run around with an empty cup anymore. You don't have to run around trying to fill it with the things of the world and trying to figure out how can I do better? What's next? I just need to feel a little bit better. Because you've embraced what God has done for you. 
you don't have two hands to grasp on to other things because you're latched on to him and his merciful love. And the purpose behind it is we live in a very fallen and broken world. Jesus is speaking to these disciples that will go out into the nations and preach the name of Jesus and tell everybody the kingdom of heaven is coming near. And then after Jesus passes, they will tell them that the Messiah has come and he has gone and he has died for your sins because God is merciful and he has paid your debt. You need to embrace what he has offered you, which is he has extended grace and love and compassion because we are his children. You got to latch on to the fact that he is a merciful God because if you don't acknowledge the fact that you are broken and he is merciful, what are we doing? We're just side hugging God, hoping and praying our way through life, going through the motions continuously. Church, I can, I can tell you from my experience, not as a pastor, but as somebody who served alongside most of you, who has gotten to know a lot of you, that it is evident when you're embracing mercy. You're excited to get up in the morning to go to work so you could have the opportunity to share the gospel. You're excited to come to church on Sunday because you get to fellowship with other believers who fully acknowledge they're not perfect and they're embracing mercy. You're excited to open his, open his word and have dialogue with the creator of the universe, the one who has authored these words, the one who has invented and crafted and created mercy for the sheer fact so that he could build a bridge with you and tell you he loves you. It goes beyond just the intimate relationship with you have with God, but how you serve, how you lead, holding the door open for somebody, showing up early on a Sunday, going to these different events for no other reason but the fact that there's an opportunity for somebody to see what you've experienced by latching on to a merciful God. How can you share a story, your story of how God has impacted you if you've never let him really impact you? How can you be so excited that God is dwelling inside of you if you don't let him work? How can you feel a sense of forgiveness and fulfillment if you never latch on and embrace mercy? Church, today, take a moment and ask yourself, have I decided to embrace the mercy, the love that God has extended, or have I just decided that I'm just going to lock arms with God or come alongside God or he's just with me? Don't let today go by without fully embracing mercy. Psalm 51, 1 through 12, or 1 through 2 says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead. Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive others uh, their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. Matthew 18, 33 says, Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? James 2, 13 says, For the judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is everything. Mercy is the reason why we get up in the morning and why our lungs are filled with an everlasting sense of purpose and love. Jesus did not come here. The Son of Man did not come here. Just to be present. He didn't come because of the good views and the good food. He came with purpose. He gave his life for a purpose. Let's not demean his or water down his contribution, his purpose for here on earth, especially if we're Christ followers. If we acknowledge he's come and died for all of our sins and he's come to show us what mercy really looks like, 
Let's stop wading through life, hoping that there'll be a good result at the end. Or just thinking that if we just partially give our lives over to God or kind of read the word or just do the best we can. Matthew 9, 13 says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Church, I plead with you. I plead with you. Not as a pastor, but as a fellow Christ follower. Embrace mercy. Embrace mercy. It is a foundational truth. Acknowledge the fact that you are broken and you are in need of a Savior and embrace mercy. Stop thinking God doesn't know your heart and who you are and why you're undeserving. He does. He does. I don't know if that's a revelation to anybody, but he does know the motives of your heart. But church... Take the opportunity. Acknowledge the fact that he is here and waiting for you to embrace mercy. We can't experience the blessed life until we embrace mercy. And it's only until we really embrace mercy can we ever hope to share the mercy of Christ with others. The purpose behind the extension of mercy, the sharing and shedding of blood, is so that people can experience the mercy of God. And they can't experience the mercy of God, at least not the fullness of it, until you embrace mercy. Let mercy, your motivation behind everything, let mercy be that. Let the fact that God loves you be enough. Understand that God is the one who has given us mercy to begin with. We're going to experience all of those hard things, but the only way to experience the blessed life that God is speaking to these disciples about is to understand and embrace mercy, to show mercy. Everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. Dear Jesus, I pray that in the darkness of this room, that these people would, these brothers and sisters would take a moment and reflect. Am I I embracing mercy today? Have I been embracing mercy? Have I been embracing mercy? Or have I just been side hugging God and hoping that everything will be okay? Lord, I pray that we would not leave this place without asking ourselves the question, am I embracing mercy? Perhaps there's someone here today who doesn't know the Heavenly Father, who'd like to know what it means to truly embrace mercy and what God has for them. In just a moment, when we sing these songs, there's going to be people in the four corners of this room. I pray that we would not leave here today without asking the question, how do I embrace mercy? We'd have the courage and boldness to get out of our seats and to ask someone, how do I embrace mercy?
Lord, I pray as we sing these words, we would express a deep sense of gratitude of what your son has done for us. Lord, that we would worship, we would sing, we would be reminded of the fact that we are worshiping the one who has extended us mercy because you love us. Church, I pray that today would be the day that we embrace mercy. It's your great name I pray. Amen.